Boardroom Bound, Episode 40, Building Awareness on the Importance of Board Diversity with Deb Pine. You know, it, it's a business imperative. You know, three years ago, I think we were spending time trying to prove the case for why diversity matters. And I think right now in corporate America, people are understanding the case has been made. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Boardroom Bound. My name is Alexander Lowry, and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership in the boardroom. My goal is to give aspiring and existing directors the tips, tactics, and strategies necessary to transform your confidence and build a successful career as a board director. Quick reminder, you can get all of today's show notes at podcast.gordon.edu. And in today's show, we'll be speaking with Deb Pine. And Deb is an experienced entrepreneur and business leader. And she is also the executive director for the Center for Women in Business and Executive Education at Bentley University. Deb is someone that I am partnering with as part of the steering committee for the 2020 Women on Boards movement. They host the annual event on November 21st. It's happening all around the country, and they host it for the Boston area. Thrilled to be working with her. There is so much great work that they do in the center to advance the cause for women, including onto the boardroom. And Deb has incredible facts and figures that will blow your mind about the situation, the importance of it, the progress that we're making, and they really hit home and they resonate. And what we'll also today is talk about what that means, the importance for boards in terms of diversifying, the importance for organizations having that different leadership type team. So much information to share with you today. I can't wait for it. Let's jump into the show. Deb Pine, welcome to the Boardroom Bound podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be here. Well, for me, this is an exciting thing because it's worlds colliding in a good way. So I'd love having you on the show because we've already been working together as part of the, the steering committee for the November 21st Women on Boards event that we're happening here in Boston that you guys are, are hosting at Bentley. But of course, there's so many more reasons we should be talking than just that. And you guys do some great work for promoting women and their opportunities in their career. Boards are just one part of that. So we'll, we'll talk about all of that today. But just to help our audience understand your background and your experience and how they got there, because, you know, hearing that you're running the Center for Women in Business and Executive Education uh, at Bentley is, is really cool, but someone's probably going, how did she get there? How does that work? So maybe you can just give us a little flavor around that. Well, like everyone's career, my path was kind of circuitous. Um, I consider myself an entrepreneur by trade. So back in the um, early 90s, I started a firm with a couple of partners called Prevision Marketing, and we were a customer loyalty firm, and we built that business to a $35 million uh, business, and were able to have a successful exit, and um, I found myself retired at a very early age with young kids, and uh, the phone just kept on ringing, and I was (laughs) able to take on a lot of different activities, working in venture capital, And really, I was brought to Bentley by the mission. Uh, The mission of the Center for Women in Business is really to advance women in workplace diversity. And we say from the classroom to the boardroom. So the idea of helping prepare the next generation of leaders, both men and women, to lead in their organizations and build an inclusive organization where all diverse candidates are welcome and encouraged, as well as to work with corporations to affect policies and culture to help welcome those people into the workforce. It's just been very rewarding over the last three years. And and what's it like? So you've been there, uh, I think it was like April of 16 when you joined, so around three years at this point. I imagine things have grown and developed in exciting ways. What does it feel like for you now? What are you doing at this moment? And what do you sort of plan for the future? Yeah, uh, yeah we're at a di- definitely at a different point in the center's career um, as an organization. We have our work with our students has exploded. We have a very comprehensive four-year women's leadership program. I think we're the only undergraduate business school that has an active male allies program. But beyond the work we do for students, the demand for corporate work in terms of helping organizations understand what the issues are to, to attract, develop, and retain women and diverse candidates has just been amazing. So we do a lot of in-house training uh, from our center as well as through our executive education part of our business in terms of helping organizations be more inclusive. 
And we should just put a little flavor around this. So if someone is, is new to this topic of conversation, wondering why should we focus so much on uh, diversity and what that means and the benefits from it, you know, I love one of the anecdotes would simply be if we were starting today for every new corporate board director being just a woman, it would take, what, about 40 years to get to boardroom gender Absolutely. equality? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And that's, you know, it's, it's been a slow, yeah, I say the movement has been glacial. We can talk about the reasons why it's been so slow. Uh, but, you know, it, it's a business imperative. You know, three years ago, I think we were spending time trying to prove the case for why diversity matters. And I think right now in corporate America, people are understanding the case has been made. The research shows the results are out there that uh, organizations that are more diverse at every level, including the board level, are more productive financially, they're more innovative, um, and they just have greater financial returns and greater um, retention rates among their employee base. So I think the business case has been made, but now it's really about how do we get there? What are the tools we need to help make us more successful or to get there faster? And it's interesting, and I'd love your opinion on this. When when people think diversity, and clearly we're talking about the, the women's center, right? We can easily see that in a photo of someone is a male or a female. Uh, you might be able to see skin color, uh, perhaps disability, but there's all sorts of different backgrounds and experience, maybe from different part of the world. You have a, a different socioeconomic background. And to me, you need all of that around, say, a boardroom table to innovate. Uh, if a group is just pale, male, and stale, I think it would be very hard to think about, well, if my customer is a, a 20 year old female who is a veteran from the military and we have no one that can speak to that it must be very hard but for someone to understand well you're focused on on females but there's this larger diversity how do you speak to that aspect of it well i'm glad you asked that question because really um the real focus really has become really the concept of intersectionality that mm -hmm. each of us presents in a different way yes i might be a white woman that has a advanced degree, but I may also be a caregiver. I may have a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. So it's really about understanding how our different um, aspects of who we are relate to us as a person, how intersectional they are. And we're seeing an increased awareness in corporate America for that and an appreciation. But there's a second part to that. It's not only do you have to understand what's below the surface, if you will, and appreciate that, but how do you include folks? and pull out the best in them based on those differences. Because, you know, diversity is counting. Inclusion is really a sense of belonging and getting the best out of people to produce those financial returns and those great business results. I love that the way you just described it. Inclusion is belonging, right? And we should all feel like we hopefully belong everywhere would be the ideal right. situation. And uh, when we tend to think about it on this show, we're talking about at the boardroom. And my view is that right. the board sets a tone. And, you know, there, clearly there's a photo in your report. There's a report out there. But uh, they are hiring the CEO. They are nurturing the CEO. They're seeing the top team. And all of that will filter down below. And I imagine you've probably seen some of that and experienced that yourself because you've been on boards. Uh, I'm Imagine you may have been on boards yourself where you might have been the only female or one of very few females. What's that been like for you? You know, it's interesting. Um, I have been on uh, private boards and nonprofit boards, and in most cases, I was probably the only. Um, and it's really been an interesting experience because I felt like I was carrying a burden for hmm. of gender. Uh, to having to make sure my voice was always heard in these organizations and at these board meetings and make sure that we continue the dialogue in an important way. I mean, research shows that board conversations are different when there are females on, on, in the board and right. gender diversity, that, you know, there's more likely to – women are more likely than male counterparts to talk about social issues like human rights, climate change, income inequality, and, in fact, we've seen that when there are women on the boards, there are less um, issues of things like governance-related issues, like shareholder battles and fraud, and you know. And in fact, Reuters reports that the average stock prices of gender-diverse boards outperform those with no women. So the business results are there, but being heard and being a voice at the table, not only sitting at the table, but being heard at the table, is really important to that conversation. And I felt, you know, a responsibility to always speak up. 
It's interesting, when I think back to my prior role working at J.P. Morgan, we can talk about the investing concept of risk and what that means. And this will be a very simplified methodology. But uh, the view was, if you had no women in the room talking around the investments we were making, the group would be more aggressive, we might say. And then suddenly the conversation would shift once you had at least one female in. And you can think about how uh, a male versus female invests for their long-term perspective and where they choose to take risks. It's just an example of, of how the conversation changes and the mindset changes. We had Cheryl Batchelder on our show, and she is uh-huh. a, a multi-time CEO, but is also on four different boards. And she's talked about being the first person in the boardroom who's a female and just watching the different dynamics of the members change and think, oh, we can't do it like that anymore. We always did like that, but maybe that didn't make sense. And it begins to change. And we are seeing a revolution almost in in the large public companies, for sure, especially with so many more activists saying today, are you connecting with the right, right groups? We haven't seen it at the smaller companies to the same degree yet. Do you have a, a view for why that is? Well, you know, the smaller companies are struggling to have more women on the board. I think only 10% of board members of, uh, of firms that IPO'd last year were women. So I think that they're fewer and far between. And I do want to talk about the issue of, you know, having one, because mm-hmm. research also shows that having one woman or even two isn't enough to, to shift the culture, because with one woman sitting on the board, other members sometimes see her as a token, mm-hmm. and with two on the board, they find that sometimes there's natural support and mm-hmm. to echo the comments or, or amplification, that whole term. Uh, but with even with two present, research still shows that men still see them as a minority interest in it, but when you get to three, that it's really a tipping point to affect cultural change. So I think that that's an important thing to consider as well. And I imagine part of the cultural change, I'd love to review on this, is that it becomes public and obvious. So I have a friend of mine who's a female director, and she told me at her first board meeting where it was all males and her, and she was felt like she had to ask some questions of, why are we doing things this way? Is this the right way to think about mm-hmm. it? And she said after the meeting, half of the board members individually all came up to her and said, I am so glad you're here. I'm so oppressed that you're asking these right questions. This is stuff that we've been needing to do for a long time. And she walked away scratching her head of going, if you know we needed to do it, why did you have to wait till I showed up on the board to say that? But it suddenly it felt like there was the reason that they could make that change. I, I, I grabbed, I struggled to understand that myself. Do you have any insights you can offer us? Well, you know, we do a lot of work with uh, senior teams and, you know, today a lot of the senior teams are still predominantly men. Um, and we find that sometimes men will speak out as often or feel as comfortable asking those questions because of the way things have always been. Uh, mm. So I think it's, it's, it's to the point of lack of diversity is, is lack of thought, lack, you know, of different perspectives and having differences in the room, whether it's gender or race or any of the other things that we've mentioned so far, just brings a different perspective and uh, makes people think. And I think that's an example of that. But one point that you brought up that I would love to, to talk about further is sort of shareholder activism. Please. Because uh, you mentioned that in terms of um, what's going to affect change uh, to get more women on boards, and we're seeing a lot of that going on in terms of not only government mandates, but shareholder activism um, and some of the advocacy work, for example, like the work that's being done by 2020 women on boards to encourage organizations to change their practices and to pay attention to make board diversity a priority. Because Hydrogen Struggles did a, a research report that said, you know, 46% of U.S. directors only 46% say that board diversity is a priority. So, you know, I'm questioning the other 54%. Right. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's amazing. It's amazing they're in the minority. That's impressive. (laughs) Well, it's interesting also because we we shouldn't separate the two of these. When we think of the top of organization, uh, it's either C-suite or boardroom. For some people, it's both. But your mind goes to one of those two places. And I've been so excited to see the boardroom diversity growing and changing in many ways. But the C-suite has been a lot slower to catch right. up. And, and you know, there's clearly there's, there's this fun chicken egg thing where in the past it used to be you had to be in the C-suite to get on the boardroom. Not always true today, but if we had to do that, there are so many fewer female CEOs. Now, granted, if we brought in our perspective to realize women who are running large P&Ls, it should be the equivalent of that. But forget, right. about, forget about that mental block for a moment. Why do you think we're seeing so much more success in the boardroom than in the C-suite? Um. Well, first of all, I think that um, it's it's a slow slog to get to the C-suite, right? I mean, and I think um, if you look at how boards are appointed, there is greater flexibility mm. in 
reaching out. And, you know, I think you do raise a great point, which is, you know, if you look at the, the uh, composition of the people coming into the boards, only 5% of uh, Fortune 1000 um, companies are run by women. And if you want to look even a step further, like 0.6% are women of color. Right. Um, uh, so you know, there's there's slim pickings there. It, so boards really just have needed to expand their horizons. To your point of looking for folks that have large P and L experiences. So um, you know, I, I don't. I I think the pipeline is 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 a is a challenge. Um, you know, women and men start out at equal numbers when graduating. In fact, more women are graduating with degrees than men. Mm-hmm. And at every step of the pipeline, women are falling out due to a number, a myriad of reasons, which could be the topic for a whole different <laughs> podcast, <laughs> which uh, we could go into. So I, I just think that, that that it's a slow slog to the top. And we are seeing support for the diversity in different areas. You mentioned Heidrich and Struggles before, and I talked to the partner who runs the board practice there, and he was explaining to me, we have a policy internally that for every board role that we are trying to fill, we guarantee that at least half the slate will be female, which I think is a, a wonderful thing, admirable thing. And but you made the point before, but there's also uh, minorities and different perspectives. And, uh, you know, right. suddenly if you're trying to fill a board seat and you're trying to fit all those different candidates in, it, it can feel hard to fit them all in, but as long as we're heading down with the right mentality, like we need right. to be thinking about this perspective, I think that's a good thing. We're seeing boards take different tactics. Some are expanding the number of people on the boards to open right. up seats because not a lot of people are saying, yeah, I'll put my hand up and retire so you can fill my seat, right? That's not generally the way it works. Um, right. I would love to hear from you the perspective of what you would like to see for the future of more women on boards and why. Well, first of all, you know, I think it's not only the smart thing to do, it's the right thing to do to get mm. diversity at every level of the organization. And, you know, it all starts at the top and, and the board is the top. Um, so I would love to see more diversity, not only of women on boards, but of those other, you know, race and women of color and uh, people of color. I think it's just important to, to recognize that at the most senior level. I think, you know, you talk about, um, you know, retirement ages. I mean, I think that there are things that we can do to speed up, you know, the process uh, because it's been a slow process to get to, you know, the Fortune 1000 being 20% of mm-hmm. women on boards. Um, but, we, you know, mandatory retirement ages. Right. Um, is critical. Um, term limits, perhaps? I would say term limits. Only 4% of the S&P 500 have term limits. That's crazy. <laughs> um, and half of the S&P 500 added no women directors last year. Huh. And in fact, if you, if you know the California law that just went into mm-hmm. effect, so that means you need one woman by the end of 2019 and six, um, three by the year 2021. If everybody adopted that, and I'm not saying everybody should, and I'm not necessarily advocating for for government regulation or around this, but um, if every state adopted the California law according to Bloomberg, it would open up 3,732 seats in a couple of years, hmm. and the number of women on these boards would increase by 75%. Um, as you mentioned earlier, the current rate, it's going to take us 40 years to get right. 40 years to get there. So there are things that can be done to even speed it up a little bit more besides or in addition to making sure you you have a diverse slate of candidates as part of the interviewing process. So some structural changes, I think, um, are important. And we should give some context to it for people that have just perhaps recently heard about the California law. This isn't the only place in the world that has, right. uh, if we want to call it targets or quotas, whatever we want to think about. So Norway has a fascinating one too, right? Right. 40% uh, of women on boards um, is the quota for Norway, and they've seen some dramatic changes in their board composition. So it can work. I don't know if, if politically it would work in the United States, but we'll see what happens in, in California. If anybody's going to do it, it's probably going to be California, right? Well, I do agree with you. I don't think government regulation is what we would ideally have to solve all of the problems in the world, right? But, uh, you know, I think right. 2020 women on boards, we were talking about it before, it, it's a very clear number, it's a very clear mindset, and, you know, obviously there's a branding issue we're going to have to figure out as we go forward from there, because uh, the year is coming up and they're hitting a lot of those targets. But there are a lot of great organizations that are out there that are doing similar things. So the, the 30% club, 
club, uh, right. a lot of different activities. In fact, there's so many um, that in some ways I was, I was joking with someone on a previous episode. We just need to get everybody together and get all these collaborated yeah. to bring it to a higher level. I imagine part of that might be organizations like your, yourself, Deb, where you are probably a connector between different pieces and sharing that information. Yeah. What are your thoughts on how we might, I don't want to say, march arm in arm and work together closely to, to achieve some of these great goals that we have? Well, we collaborate one, um, with the 2020 Women on Board is one of the initiatives that we do because we believe, you know, it's about, you know, raising the tide <laughs> across the, uh, the, um, the country. So we support um, their organization, and we hold on November 21st, as you mentioned, um, the um, national conversation here at Bentley University where we have an evening event with a panel discussion of folks that are on boards, both men and women, to talk about how – to get on a board, what skills you need, their experiences, their journeys, to help raise the awareness as well as to give specific tools. The other thing that we do is we really focus at every level of the pipeline on educating our people on the importance of board and what does it mean to be on a board. For mm. example, through our executive education program, we run a women's leadership program, um, and one part of that in, uh, session is really focused on board readiness. and educating women who go through that program on what are the different kinds of boards, why should you be interested in boards, what skills do you need to be on boards, how do you get there. And, you know, I even we even go through and we say, okay, there are a couple of things that you need to do in terms of board readiness. Like, you need to get educated about what it means to be on a board. And, you know, we have a resource guide of the, all the board readiness programs that are available at universities and through private organizations through the company. They need to get prepared, like have that P&L experience, which you've talked about earlier, large company experience, and understand what skills are required for governance and strategy. Um, to get networked because still 70% of these slots are still filled through word of mouth, just like any other job, right? Right. <laughs> and um, to, to seek out mentors and sponsors and to get the story out there. You know, I, there's one woman that uh, we work with who has recently uh, joined a public board, and, you know, she was really about saying, okay, uh, my I have a mentor, I have a sponsor, and he wanted me to be a CFO, and I told him, no, I want to be a CEO, and I want to be on the board. And <laughs> fast forward 12 months, she's on a board. So I think, you know, we also have to be intentional about our, our actions as well as having the preparedness. And I think the other part of that that so many people misunderstand is the importance of network is the way we talk about, but the communication to your network and sharing that desire and taking that forward because I believe it's not who you know, but what they know about you that you want, because then they can help right. you. Right. You need to set your ex- tell your story and get your story out there, whether it be to people in your network, to bankers, to M&A folks, to the hydrogen struggles and corn ferries and the world who have board practices. So it's really about getting your message and your pitch, if you will, out there about how you can add value to a board and what your key skills are. And there's also a process timeline behind a lot of this. It's generally not instantaneous, right? And you want to start early and make it happen. What is the guidance that you give people? If you just talked about a range of things they need to do about how do they think about it, how do they implement it, how long it's going to take? You know, it really varies depending on where people are in their um, careers and how networked they really are. But, you know, it's probably an eight, at least an 18-month process. Um, and if you go through a board readiness program, it probably will take you a little bit longer because there's a whole, a whole process in terms of, you know, you don't just put out your resume. It's sort of a board readiness, a board resume for to talk about what you skills you bring and what value you would add and um, what connections you need to make to get you to find out where those spots are. And there are a number of resources. For example, the Boston Club here in Boston has a database of um, opportunities that our people are looking to place the board uh, uh, board readiness program, uh, board slots in. Um, so there are board um, databases in a number of different companies. So you need to figure out where they are and continue to network. But it's, it's not a, a quick process. It takes time. And the interesting thing is once you do have a board seat, it's easier to get the second one of course. that first one <laughs> because you're sort of quote-unquote board certified once you're on a board. So it's easier for you to make that transition. And of course, it, to be easier. of course, if you're doing well, the networking magically happens because people are right. on boards, know about other people on right. boards, and they see you at your it, best. And Exactly. Exactly. 
And I, I would love if you could speak a little bit to the event that we'll both be at together November 21st that Bentley is hosting women, the Women uh, on Board for 2020 movement because I know we, as a steering committee we're talking about, we expect it'll be even bigger than the, the last year. What's it going to look and feel like? For someone who's thinking about, you know, I'd love to be there, uh, help them get over the fear of they've never been there before. Maybe they have no idea how they start their board journey. Yeah, first of all, this, this event is one of the, my favorite events that we do every year because it not only is purposefully driven and um, educational, but it's also um, networking focused as well as sort of um, social. So this is an event we hold here at Bentley. It'll be on November 21st, and it is from 530 to 830. And what we do as part of that event is talk about the importance of, you know, women on boards and diversity on boards, and then really facilitate a discussion amongst women and some men who have gone through the journey to talk about what their journey is like, what key skills when they're sitting on a board they look for in other board members. So it gives women and men who will be in the audience, and I know you will be joining us right now. <laughs> I will, yes. <laughs> Um, an opportunity to understand and facilitate discussions around that, do some networking, and make some contacts. So it is a fundraiser for 2020 Women on Boards, which is a phenomenal organization that's really committed to advancing women onto boards, uh, not only in the Fortune 1000, but now the Russell 3000, um, to really get greater diversity on boards. And Deb, I just want to circle back to a point you made earlier in the show. You were talking about how women need allies, uh, and they need male allies, uh, particularly in times, in order to help tap into the network and be the right people to go forward. And I will not be the token male at the event. There will be some other males. For example, on your panel, you always have at least one man, because you need that other perspective to answer the question. So maybe we can talk a little bit more about this for women. So it's not just you bringing together the great and the good. And, and I understand as women from all point in their careers who will be there. Maybe there's some that are thinking, I'm early on, and in 10 years, I want this goal to others thinking I'm ready and I need to be it tomorrow. Help us understand more of the audience, what it'll look like. Uh, the audience, it, just as you said, it is, is a variety of, of women, mostly women, but we do have men who come to that who are allies. Um, and it's women who are want to get educated about, what, A, what does it mean to be on a board and how do I get there? So I would say it's women from probably 10 years in, in work up until 30 years in their careers who are looking for board service opportunities. And they want to know how to get started. You know, what do they need to do? Uh, it, it, it's amazing to me how little information there is out there. So this is really an educational opportunity as well as a networking opportunity because we have people who are on boards who are there who would like to get to know these women as well. And of course, this is not just in Boston, although this is where it started, right. but this is now an international conversation. So Stephanie Sonnebend uh, has also been on this podcast talking about it. And this, I believe, is the first year where it's not going to be just the U.S. So there's cities all across the country, especially every major city you can think of will be having on this same day, November Absolutely. 21st. But there's now international. I believe there's London and Mexico City. So it's great to see how this is really uh, encouraging people all around the world. Yes, that organization has done fabulous work and it's really made a difference to getting more women on boards and we're proud to be partners with them and of course i'm excited that you and i get to partner together in this great city of the boston <laughs> area to make all of this work so we would encourage people to be looking for that and and to that point deb if people wanted to follow up either to learn more about that event or to learn about uh, the center that you have at bentley and the great work you're doing or just follow you personally how should people be connecting what would you recommend so I'm on LinkedIn, Deborah Pine, D-E-B-O-R-A-H-P-I-N-E, and our center is um, can be accessed at uh, Bentley.edu, Center for Women in Business. And we also have research reports on a number of diversity uh, and inclusion issues, like the whole topic of intersectionality that can be downloaded from our site as well under research. So I would encourage people who are interested in topics like that, as well as mentorship, sponsorship, and networking, um, to, to check out our site and the uh, different events that we have going on. And I think you gave us a flavor for a lot of your research today because there was a lot of knowledge that you dropped, a lot of facts and figures that really helped drive the point home. So I would encourage all of our audience to go and look for some of that. And, and Deb, we were just delighted to have you on the show today. Thank you for sharing your insights and helping all of our audience to be boardroom bound. Well, thank you so much. And we're all in this together to make a difference. So we're proud to be partners. That's it for this episode of Boardroom Bound. I really enjoyed chatting with Deb Pine. It's amazing to see the facts and figures laid out about 
the progress that has been made, which is good, but how much more there is to go and the importance of doing so. And Deb did it in a very fun and easygoing way. And clearly it's building up to things like the 2020 Women on Boards movement that we're working on together. I'm really excited to be, well, I am the only male representative on the steering committee for the Boston event November 21st, but I take that with a point of pride. Uh, working together in partnership because we would love to see more diversity of thought in a boardroom. This is a fabulous event. I highly recommend it. I hope people will be able to come, whether you're in Boston or you attend an event in one of the other major cities. And I hope to see you there. And one final note for today, I'm very excited to share that I'll be speaking at the Sound Education Conference. This is an annual event at Harvard in Boston. And this year on Saturday the 12th, the final day of the conference, I'll be speaking about, no surprise, the Boardroom Bound podcast. The entire conference is a celebration of educational audio about how we get our word out there, how we share it with people, how we present it in the right way. And I'll be getting to talk about why boards are important, how people pursue those opportunities. Delighted to be sharing the message, and I'm very hopeful I'll get to see some of my listeners in person at the event. Now remember to head over to podcast.gordon.edu where you can get links to all of today's resources. And please know that the Boardroom Bound team and I are so proud to be your go-to podcast for all things that connect, prepare, and empower you to land a board seat. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss any of the high-quality content we're bringing to you every Wednesday. And thanks for joining me today. I can't wait to share more stories and strategies from brilliant business minds with you again next week. Remember to keep tuning in to be boardroom bound.